Good morning, everybody. I apologize for the child over there. First reading is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If anyone thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. No more favorites there in the evening. <laughs> this morning's second scripture reading also from the New Testament and continuing in Paul's letters, this from the book of Romans, the 10th chapter, the first 15 verses. And if you're using a Red Church Bible, that starts on page 1098. Again, the 10th chapter of Romans, the first 15 verses. Paul writes to the church, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes about this righteousness that, by, that, that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the message concerning faith that we proclaim if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. May the Lord add his blessing. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just sang, He touched me, and we pray that would be true again this morning, uh, that the Lord Jesus would touch us, not, not by my human power or by human might, but by your Spirit, says the Lord. 
and it's in Jesus' name I commit this time. Amen. So folks, uh, this morning uh, I want to touch on the idea of having zeal, but not according to knowledge. And if you take a look in Romans chapter 10, verse 2, the Apostle Paul says about his fellow countrymen, they have a zeal, but not in accordance with knowledge. Uh, folks, there's a lot of zeal going on today about a whole lot of things, and it's not according to knowledge. It, it's devoid of truth. Uh, let, me, let me translate. Zeal not according to knowledge is zeal not in accordance to the truth. Uh, we see it with religion. We see it culturally and politically. As a pastor, I see it biblically. You know, people taking a couple of scriptures and presenting a biblical argument and yet ignoring like 20 other scriptures. Now, uh, uh, believe it or not, I've been here for over 30 years. Uh, some would say too long. Some would say it's okay. I'll, I'll let God decide that, right? And you know me by now. Uh, I don't tell generally cutesy stories. I don't give you uh, the razzle-dazzle or the softball stuff. Uh, I tell a joke occasionally, a funny to lighten up our moment. Uh, but I'm serious about this time, right? I don't peddle the cream puff messages, right? I don't seek to tickle your ears. I give you what's in the gospel. I've said this before. The biggest failure is right here in our churches, our pulpits. Sad to say that, because I have a pulpit. But you have a pulpit too. Do you speak truth to people? Because there are times where God sends us, and he gives us a word, and we don't say anything. The biggest failure is when God gives us a pulpit, and we don't speak truth. And we tell cutesy stories, and we give the cream pup stuff. And, and pulpits, you know, in churches, have been the biggest problems for the last 50 to 75, maybe 100 years. It, it's, it actually comes down to how do you tell people nothing in 25 minutes or less? That's what it's come down to. It, it's a failure to teach and instruct. It's a failure to take spiritual truth and connect the dots. You know, I, I once read years ago, I, I can't remember, that was like the late 90s, early 2000s. There was a church in California, always, everything seems to start in California, doing drive-in, you know, drive-up church. Eight-minute message, gone. Eight-minute message and I'm off to the beach. Now, uh, good luck with that. How do you, I mean, I could, give you, I could give you a few scriptures, you know, in eight minutes or less. I mean, by the time the guys are done reading our two pa passages of scripture, you have eight minutes, right? Uh, Hosea said in chapter 4, verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Destroyed. Do you, do you know that, this is amazing, I once had an English course, and the assignment in the English course was how to say nothing in 500 words or less. <laughs> Write an essay and say 500 words or less. At the time, I remember 500 words being daunting. And after you learn to say nothing in 500 words or less, it's not as daunting, right? That was the assignment. Uh, uh, Charles Dickens, take his novels, right? They're like six inches thick. He got paid by the word. That's why the, the, the novels are so thick, right? Oh, oh, that our pulpits would say more than 
You know, so, say something in 500 words or less if you have an eight-minute message. Why is that? Why, why is it that the truth is not coming from the pulpits? Because our churches have been infiltrated. Worldly thinking dominates. Garbage thinking prevails. Uh, earthly wisdom resonates. We've been bombarded with worldly thoughts and ways. And we have not taught people to think critically for themselves. We have not pe taught people to study for themselves. It's about control. We have not taught, taught people to properly study Scripture. You know, if you're going to build a bridge, you have to have principles to build a bridge. If you're going to do accounting, right, Bill? You have to have principles of accounting. If you're going to do Bible study, you have to have principles that govern the interpretation of Scripture. And we have not taught people to work through these things. To work through issues, to defend the scriptures, to defend the faith. People are clueless. They don't know how to answer problems. We've indoctrinated. We haven't educated. And I believe it's a byproduct of our educational system. Our society. We want Bud Light. That's what we want. We don't want too much stuff... That's, that's going to make us work hard for it. People don't want to work hard for anything anymore. They don't want to work hard to know the scriptures. They just want the cutesy message and they want to be off to the beach. You know, you go back 150, 200 years. I mean, these people preached for hours. That People came and spent all day at church. The Bible was foundational. It was the only book, right, Harold? The only book that they used in school. And look, look at the great men and women of God that were turned out. Uh, how have we gotten here? How have we gotten here? You know, as they say, as the church goes, so goes society. And it's true. I don't know how many years ago it was, but one Sunday morning, we had about 15 or 16 people come into our church. It was kind of like, you know, an invasion, right? They came up from Texas. They brought their pastor with them to help them find a church. That would be, I don't know, that would be like Carl and Noreen moving to Florida and say, Pastor Jerry, will you come with us and uh, help us pick a church? Should not a pastor have taught them how to pick a church? Just like you teach your children how to make good choices? Now, you know, for whatever reason, they never came back. I guess we didn't cut the mustard, right? It's amazing. I want, I want to challenge us all this morning to think biblically and to think conceptually and philosophically. Because if we do not think according to Scripture, and we don't think conceptually and with a biblical philosophical framework, we are prone to be misguided in everything. We're prone to be zealous, but not according to the knowledge of the truth. Now, folks, I can be zealous about a lot of things, and I know you can too. We get swept up in it. But is it according to the knowledge of the truth? Uh, if you take a look at Romans 10 here, Paul brings a message back to preaching Christ. Uh, Christ is the end of the law. If he's the end of the law, you don't have to worry about eating and drinking and all the dietary stuff and whatever. He's the end of the law. When, what day you're going to worship on. You don't have to worry about it. He's the end of the law. He's God's righteousness. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And it's so, so simple. It's so simple. And yet, what, what did Paul write to the Corinthians? That, you know, just like the devil beguiled and deceived Eve, he does that to us too. It's so simple and we make it so complex. And that's why we have a spiritual famine in the land. It's not simply Christ and his word anymore. It's the cream puff stuff. 
And believers are not thinking through the issues. And this is why our society is going to hell in a handbasket on a greased pole real quick. Where is the church? We're not thinking through the issues, folks, be it spiritual, cultural, political, social, or economic. We don't do it. You know, what was it? Uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think. It, uh, it's a little paperback book. Drew, help me out here. It's a little paperback book where you corral a pig. What's the name of the book? I think you're thinking of Animal Farm. Oh, Animal Farm. Thank you. Oh, um, okay. Well, it's Animal Farm. But you want to basically take a wild animal, that's what it is, a wild animal, and corral it. You know, you, you start putting the feet on the ground, and you start building the fence. And next thing you know, you, you got it in its pen. And that's what, thanks Drew, that's what people, that's what people are, are following. That's what the church has done. Uh, we've, we've just bought, bought right into it. We're not processing uh, we regurgitate what we hear, don't we? That's what we do. You know, just like the little mama bird, you know, regurgitate stuff to baby bird, and baby bird eats, that's what we do. We just, we just take what's regurgitated. We don't process. And, and it has huge and profound implications for our society, because we're the church. Now, I, I ask this, the, the, this, this question, and... and uh, is the Bible relevant today? Well, of, of course it is. That's why you're here. It's culturally relevant. It's politically relevant. It's morally and spiritually relevant. Second Timothy 3 verse 16 says, All scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God or woman may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Uh, Peter reinforces this truth, seeing, uh, 2 Peter 1.3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. I, I gave you the eight-second version of why the Bible's relevant. And, and if it is, then we should be filtering everything. And we don't. Uh, Jesus said in John 17, verses 14 through 16, he spoke of believers not being of this world. That means that you're an alien, you're a stranger, you're a pilgrim, and you're just passing through, right? And yet, what, what do we do? We want to encamp. We want to be, we, we want to be dwellers. That's what we do. We don't sort the issues of light and darkness, truth and error, right and wrong, what's of God and what's not, who is on the Lord's side and who's not. We, we, we just assume that, oh, everybody's good. Everybody's for, you know, for good stuff. Not everybody's for God. Not everybody is for the Word of God. And, and so if we're going to filter, what does this mean? It includes what people say. It includes what people teach. It includes what people promote culturally, politically, spiritually, socially, and even economically. Top to bottom. Everything that touches your life and mine. We need to filter that. From the pastor or the preacher to the politician to the educator to the media to the cultural and the economic think tanks in Washington. You've got to listen to what they say. Because a lot of it is not of God. The Apostle Paul, I'm sorry, the Apostle John says in 1 John 2, verse 27, that as, as believers, we have an anointing from the Holy One. That means you have the Holy Spirit that teaches you. We're able, we're able to sort through. We're able to sort through it all, but are we? And that, and that anointing, that anointing involves the principle of using the mind of Christ. Months ago, when we were videotaping up here, I did a series of messages on the mind of Christ. 
Uh, Paul tells us to renew that mind. Second, uh, at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. The renewing of the mind. Uh, God gives us His Holy Spirit to sort through what is truth and what is, what is error. Scripture is the lens and the filter through which we see the world as it is. Christ in the Word is our point of reference. And if it's not, this is what we get in society. And it's sad. Now, I have to tell you, um, there are times where I've regurgitated like everybody else. Uh, regurgitation is not necessarily a bad thing. If it's the truth, and it's based on fact, then it's okay to regurgitate, amen? Because it's truth. But today, people are regurgitating all sorts of falsehood. There's no second thought. It's automatic. It's knee-jerk. Everyone's saying it, so I say it. Everyone's doing it, so I do it. Let me, let me give you some cultural and political examples of where people are regurgitating and not really thinking through the issues. Okay? Now, I'm not going to get political, but I'm going to touch on some of the politics and cultural because it's relevant, because this is why we are in our society for the last hundred years, because we haven't done it. We haven't done it. Let, let's take, for example, the Black Lives Matter saying. Black Lives Matter, right? Almost everyone is regurgitating that saying. Now, but I want you to think about it. It's only a platitude. That is, it's only a slogan. Because the truth of the matter is, oh. all lives matter. Thank you. All lives matter. Now, let me tell you how that progression goes. And because la Black Lives Matter is a platitude, we have now a follow-up counterpoint to Blue Lives Matter. You see? Because the police were bl being abused, and so they came out and they said, Blue Lives Matter, another platitude. And folks, it's a devilish wisdom. That's what it is. When we begin to elevate one group above another, when, when that happens, you get social division. Is that what God wants? I don't think so. But people don't think, and they just simply regurgitate. They put the bumper sticker on their car. And, and out of concern for being socially and politically and culturally and economically boycotted, you have corporations and business, businesses in the community. They embrace these platitudes so they don't lose money and they don't give any thought to what they're doing. And they do more harm than good. And by the way, just as an aside, we, we see this elevation of one group over another. Think about it when it comes to capital punishment. You see, because if you kill a politician, or you kill a cop, or you kill a, you destroy a government building like, and a bunch of people like Timothy McVeigh, you see, then, you, then you're put to death. But you know, if you kill you or me, uh, you're not put to death. Because your life is not as important as the other life. And you see, that's how we get there, you see? And they're double standards. And that's not equality. And it becomes socially problematic. And that's why you have what you have. You have two sets of laws for one group. Uh, two sets of laws. One for one and one for another. That's what you have. That's how we get there. And yet, Scripture teaches if you take a life, black, blue, brown, white, it doesn't matter, you should be put to death. That's what it says. Now, back to the, bl the Black Lives Matter for a minute. Because I want you, and I think it's very, very important for people in the church, believers, and people in society, to make this distinction. It's important to look at the movement and to look at the organization. Uh, because a distinction needs to be made between the two. Last month, 
I read an article in Decision Magazine, uh, magazine Billy Graham Magazine, actually promoted, put out by Franklin Graham, and uh, the article was written by a black woman, Miki Addison, and you can go to, to the blacklivesmatter.com to confirm what she wrote, or at least what, how she summarized their points. But she summarized the Black Lives Matter platform with three bullet points. Let me read them for you. Black Lives Matter, the organization, seeks to dismantle the biblical definition of family. You can find that on their website, okay? Black Lives, number two, Black Lives Matter champions the celebration of homosexuality. Did you know that? You can find that on their website. It was started by three gay women, okay? Black Lives Matter touts gender confusion as normal and seeks to make heroes of those who are mentally confused. You can find that on their website. They tout gender differences. Now, why do I bring that up? Because that's not a godly organization with a godly agenda. It's not even a social justice message. It's an agenda that promotes social chaos. And yet, everybody runs to embrace it because of the slogan, Black Lives Matter. Now, let's analyze the movement. It's a movement, the Black Lives Matter movement is a movement that arose out of social justice concerns regarding police tactics and how they were too heavy-handed in resulting in the death of black people. Well, if black lives really matter, and they do because all lives matter, then they should be greatly concerned about addressing the drug and the gang bang, the drug gangs and the gang banging in our inner cities because it's killing blacks at unprecedented rates. And what about, what about abortions? Seven of ten abortions in this country are black people, black children, babies, never see the light of day. If there was great, great concern about truly about Black Lives Matter, then you would see them addressing it. Now, by the way, wasn't it the other week there were some people that went in front of abortion clinics and used chalk and wrote, um, unborn, black lives. unborn Black Lives Matter. They were arrested. You see, so, so it's, not, it's not really about life now, is it? It's a political agenda. It's an ungodly agenda. That's what it is. And I share this. I share this so you can perhaps be a little more savvy and aware of what's happening in your surroundings so you can be a little more educated when you vote, and a little bit more educated when you speak to people, a little bit more educated when you seek to represent God as one cent. That's why I share it. And you know, we're, we're all easily caught up in what we hear, and we rarely think through the issues, right? You ever take an onion? And you start, I love onions. Oh, I love onions, right? I don't like it when it makes me cry. I don't like to cry. But you start cutting it, and you start peeling it back. It's like, oh, that was rotten. You got to start peeling back the onion, folks. You got to start seeing what's inside. Uh, Paul, Paul says that the church is the foundation and the pillar of the truth. You represent God. I represent God. Uh, we hold forth the word of life. We're sanctified in this truth. Jesus said, thy word is truth. Father, sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. How does this happen if we, like the world, just regurgitate everything we hear and we don't sort through it? And my concern as believers is that we sort through it. That's the reason for this message. Got to sort through it. You know, we're, we're, we're studying the book of Revelation Wednesday night, and we're talking about how is it that people are going to just lock, stock, and bar barrel, take the name, the number 666, and not see the signs coming and all the stuff that's going to happen. Why? Because they've got, either gotten rid of the Word of God, or people have totally dismissed it. Oh, well, that's just fairy tale stuff. People aren't sorting through. 
we need to do our homework. We need not to just regurgitate. We need to think. You need to spiritually analyze. Connect the dots. Assess everything in light of Scripture. We need to do it. That, that's why, because we're not doing it, that's why our communities and our society is the way it is. We don't seek to even set the table anymore. We've been pushed off to the side. I, was, I wasn't sure if I was led to preach on this this week, but I guess I wasn't. 1 Samuel 16. Samuel was grieving over Saul's foolishness. Remember God rejected Saul? God comes to Samuel and he says, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him? Get up and go to Bethlehem and anoint David. And you know what happens? We, we let our emotions get in the way. Well, I, yeah, I love my family. Oh, I love so-and-so, or I care for this, or I'm passionate about that. Rather than, and we mourn, or rather, rather than just doing what God tells us to do, or say what God tells us to say. At a certain point, we just need to let it go, and we need to go with God. I'll give you, I'll give you two more relevant cultural examples. It involves the media. Um, now, 90% of the media in this country is liberal. And the media is corrupt and it promotes an agenda and you probably know that. And, and it's not about fact-finding or promoting discussion for debate anymore. It's about promoting an agenda. And, you know, even though Donald Trump coined the phrase fake news. It's been fake news for a very, very long time. You just don't know it. You just haven't heard it. He kind of brought clarity to it, right? But the American media has been pushing a social, socialistic agenda for the last 80 years. And here's the problem with socialism. Socialism is an economic form of communism, and communism has killed more people in this last decade than it has in the last 500 years. Once you get the guns, they're coming for you. I'm telling you, they're going to come for you. And they don't, it's, a, it's a godless agenda. That's why I point that out. Now, let me give you an illustration of fake news. I read this book. It was given to me for Christmas. It was about the British spy ring. I may have referenced it a couple years ago. About the British spy ring in World War II. It was a great, great book. They sent a British spy ring over here to infiltrate America socialite society and connect with people who owned the media like 500 newspapers and things like that. And what they would do is they would befriend them and they would manipulate. And you know MI6, which would be the CIA equivalent, they got somebody on the Chicago Tribune newspaper to write articles favorable for the United States to get into war to sway public opinion. You see? That's what the media does. It's all about swaying you one way or the other. Regurgitating. That's what it is. And, and we get caught up in that stuff. Uh, you, know, you know history, by the way, but we got into the war, didn't we? That was the goal. That was the agenda, you see? So I want you... I, I give you a little task this week. As you listen to the news, because I'm assuming that you may, right? Or when you read something, listen or see how, listen to the nuance of how they frame something. How they word it in a positive or a bad light. Listen to the words, parse the thoughts, listen to the questions. Because it's put in such a way to draw you in to their point of view. Rather than God's point of view, you see? And you'll see how devilish and demonic it is. I promised you two examples, right? I'll give you two very quick examples. Uh, the media has not properly reported on the virus. They haven't. If you, go, if you go and you really start digging and you start looking for facts and truth, 
you'll realize they haven't. There are two drugs right now that help 92% of the time with people who get very, very sick with COVID. But they've just been totally dismissive of it. Uh, and there's been clinical studies, foreign and domestic, domestic, that have proven that. But what they do is they squash it. And they take doctors off of social media when they want to come out and they want to blow the whistle. That's what they do. It's to control the message. Three separate studies were done, folks, by the way, and you might find this interesting. They, they took a sampling of people, and 40 to 45, and 40 to 45 percent of these three studies, people who had COVID were asymptomatic. In other words, I suppose I could have it now, or you could have it now, and you'd be asymptomatic, you see? So what does that mean? So if, if that's the case, where people are not showing that they have it, but they do, then many more people are infected based on the numbers being reported, okay? And then this also means that the statistics about the virus are way off in left field, which now also means that it doesn't hold up to st statistical scrutiny with the death rate. Oh, three out of every hundred people are going to die. No. If you've got millions who have it, but they're not reporting it. So, so here, here's a, statistics are not my thing, but here's the point. If you've got millions who are asymptomatic, then the numbers don't add up. They just don't add up. Second relevant example arising out of the Black Lives Matter movement. We see a defund the police movement. What is, that's the most dumbest and buffoonery idea I've seen in a hundred years. Not that I'm a hundred years of age. <laughs> it's stupid. Genesis 9, Romans 13, they're foundational passages to promote government. We have government because we live in a fallen world. And the first order and responsibility of government is to protect its citizens. Law and order. Defund the police. How stupid. And yet, I know people who are caught up in this and they believe in that. That's stupid. When government oversteps its bounds, we have controls in place that need to address that. When government violates the word of God and forces its subjects to side with the state over siding with God, then we are to not comply with the state. It's called resistance. Not violent resistance, but I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. John MacArthur has thousands. We, we only have what? We, have, we, we don't have the big church. John MacArthur has thousands. He wrote a letter because the governor of California wants to shut them down. He goes, I'm sorry, we're not complying. We are going to disob civil disobedience. We're not complying with your order. Because statistically, he said, you got 40 million people in the state, and you've had 8,500 deaths. And if you start to run the numbers, it doesn't add up. Praise God for John MacArthur. Despite how you feel about him and various opinions about stuff, that's the right decision. So anyone or group promoting defunding the police is not only taking an anti-biblical stance, they're taking an un-American un stance. It's stupid. And, and if, if black lives really matter, what communities are hurt the most? The poorest. It, you know, we're living in some very, very troubled times. Misguided zeal. Zeal that's misplaced. Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but it leads to death. God's ways and principles have been kicked to the curb. How do we get them back? I'm almost done. Just stay with me. In the Gospels, Jesus spoke of the leaven of the Pharisees. The expression, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And he consistently challenged them at every point with the Word of God. 
their ideas. And when it didn't line up with scripture, he challenged them. And he spoke out against them. And he presented truth. Now we're back to the pulpits. You have a pulpit. You have the opportunity to challenge people. You should. This is my pulpit. And I have pulpits when I leave this pulpit. And I challenge people. And I've gotten into debates and discussions. But you know what I'm finding? There's a lot of people who are saying, yeah, I'm not really sure I'm buying this. Start to see through it after a while, you know? It's kind of like, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, the Wizard of Oz, you know, when Toto runs up and he pulls, up, he pulls the curtain, you know, and you see all the controls. You've heard of Apollos, right? Acts chapter 18, Apollos was mighty in the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, and he was going around and, and he was teaching. But Aquila and Priscilla pulled him aside and instructed him, the scripture says, in the way more accurately. That's how we bring it back. We instruct people. We teach them. Uh, Apostle Paul spoke of his misguided zeal in Philippians 3. His Pharisaical experience, Pharisee of the Pharisees, confidence in the flesh, zeal for persecuting the church, killing Christians, right? Uh, he, he, he got a lot of charge out of that because he thought he was doing the right thing. And, and listen to this, only when he encountered the living Christ was he transformed. It was like, oh my goodness, I didn't even realize what I was doing. You know, when you met God, did you realize what side of the fence you were on? It's like, oh my goodness. It's a wake-up call. It's, it's divine enlightenment. That's how you get it back. You present Christ and start, after a while, people start to see the truth. The transformation begins. And when it begins with people, and it begins with the church, it will begin with society. It's true. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, he wrote in Romans 1, that the heathen became futile, futile in their speculations regarding God. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And that's what's happening in our society because the church has not been the church. Uh, if you take a look at Paul's ministry, every epistle was constantly refuting false teaching, false error, uh, error false gospels, false principles. Constantly. Because we're, we're prone to veer off. We're prone to regurgitate. It's pretty straightforward. On Christ the solid rock I stand, stand all other ground is sinking sand. God's principles work. The world's do not. It's taking God's side in the matter. It's filtering everything through scripture. Listening to the spirit of God. Finding the voice of Christ through all the noise. Having a zeal for his truth according to knowledge. And when that doesn't happen, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. As the church goes, so goes society. As the church goes, so goes society. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, forgive us for not repenting of our sin, walking away from it. Forgive us for loving it. Forgiving us for not being everything that you want us to be. Forgive us for not being the church. 
Forgive us for not speaking when you've given us pulpits. Forgive us for not heeding your spirit when you've laid it upon our hearts to share the word of God, to speak truth. Uh, we need you, Lord, to stem the tide uh, with what's happening in our churches and in our communities in our country. We pray that you would come and divinely rescue each and every one of us from that. Uh, we're concerned about not only our families, our communities, and other people, but we're concerned about the next generation. We're concerned about the gospel message. Concerned about your truth. Uh, how are they to hear unless they are sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, who bring the truth? Thank you for bringing us into the church. May we be a part of being sent. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.